On January 20th, 1993, William Jefferson Clinton became the 42nd President of the United States. At the time, most Americans were not aware of the extent of Clinton's criminal background, nor were they aware of the media blackout, which kept this information from the public. As State Attorney General and later Governor, Bill Clinton in 12 years achieved absolute control over the political, legal, and financial systems of Arkansas. As president, he would attempt to do the same with the nation by bringing members of his inner circle with him to Washington. The hijacking of America was underway, and its impact on future generations would be incalculable. Bill Clinton was born in Hope and, of course, raised in Hot Springs. They had open body houses over there at the time, and they had open gambling at the time. But Clinton grew up in that, in that atmosphere, that different atmosphere of Hot Springs. If it felt good, you did it. He was selected to go to, to the National from Arkansas Boys State to be a delegate to the National Boys Day. And while he was there, he was able to meet John Kennedy. And I'm sure that sparked an ambition uh, in this young man. And uh, he apparently has always had an exceptional, a keen mind, a keen intellect. And, and he has, uh, he early, evidently, uh, had tremendous ambition. He, he was gifted in so many ways. The truth is, he's one of the most charming men that I've ever met in my life. He has more energy than, than, than any 10 people I've ever known. He was able to network himself into running for attorney general uh, virtually unopposed. And then he was able to take that position and catapult himself into the governor's office two years later and started building his foundation. When you think about uh, Bill Clinton's aversion to the truth, you wonder uh, if this is because of the lackadaisical moral background that he's had in this area. Uh, he lied about Rhodes being a Rhodes Scholar. He never completed that and still said he was a Rhodes Scholar. He went to Moscow and did business with them uh, against the United States government, and he wasn't challenged by the press about that. In Arkansas, while he was governor, he said he balanced the budget 11 times. He never did it once. Also, he said he didn't raise taxes, and he raised taxes 126 times. He can accommodate any situation that comes up because he's not hemmed in with the truth. I've never felt that Clinton, consciously or unconsciously, was hemmed in with morality. I first met Bill Clinton in the mid to late 70s. He was an up-and-coming politician. Uh, there were a group of us, Jim Guy Tucker, uh, Bill Clinton, Sheffield Nelson, and myself and we kind of ran around and palled around with each other. It was from that point that I did a lot of projects for Bill from a marketing perspective. In 1988, I went to Bill and I said, I need uh, a job to kind of relax, mellow out. Bill Clinton and Betsy Wright, they suggested that I go to work for a place called the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. And they said my talents could really be used there. It was uh, the best kept secret in Arkansas. After about two weeks, I went to Wooten Epps and I said, Wooten, I think I've got enough background on this that we can start marketing it. Now, what is the criteria for loans? He said, whoever Bill wants to get a loan. To go back, though, to that moment in time, I'd been there about a month and I realized that I was in the epicenter of what I'd always heard about all my life. 
what most people have heard about is the machine. I was literally working, sitting in the middle of Bill Clinton's political machine. It was where he made payoffs, uh, where he repaid favors to people for campaign support. Um, I was in an interesting seat and I knew it. We had a board meeting. Um, in that particular board meeting, I was sitting at the end of the table. James Brannion, who was chairman of the board at that time, was sitting at the head of the table. James Brannion stood up in a public restaurant and he hollered at uh, the Beverly Enterprises guy, Bobby Stevens, and said, did you get the $50,000 campaign contribution from the client that, you, that you're introducing the loan for? He said, not yet. He said, well, then hold up the loan till we get it. I stood up, went up to James, and I said, James, don't yell stuff like that. You don't need to be yelling it in a restaurant. That sounds real bad. He was just burly and arrogant. He said, who cares? Bill Clinton sold the concept of ADFA to the people of Arkansas as a vehicle for creating jobs and assisting churches and schools. In reality, millions of taxpayer-guaranteed dollars were being channeled to Clinton's election campaigns, to his inner circle of friends, and to his wife Hillary's law firm. This may explain why ADFA had been drafted in such a manner as to keep its decision-making procedures secret. If you needed a million dollars, you had to get your application handled by the Rose Law Firm, pay them $50,000. There were five other companies in the state of Arkansas that were actually more qualified in bond structuring and applications, but Rose Law Firm got them all. I started checking around and I kept asking, well, you know, one thing's bothering me to the comptroller, Bill Wilson, you know, how do people make payments on these loans? He looked at me and said, they don't. He thought I knew. Well, that blew my mind. And this is about two months in, and it was getting tough then. So I started gathering the documents. After everybody left, I would stick around as if I were working on the annual report. That would give me access to all the documents. And I made copies of them all. For about two months, I watched accounts accumulate money. At the end of the month, they zero balanced. They're laundering drug money. There were a hundred million a month in cocaine coming in and out of Mena, Arkansas. They had a problem. They were doing so much money in cocaine, a hundred million. You, you create a problem in a little state like Arkansas. How do you clean $100 million a month? ADFA until 1989 never banked in Arkansas. What they would do is they would ship the money down to Florida, a bank in Florida, which later would be connected to BCCI. They would ship money to a bank in Atlanta, Georgia, which, by the way, was later connected to BCCI. They'd ship to Citicorp in New York, which would send the money overseas. And there was an interesting one, a bank in Chicago. That bank, by the way, is partially owned by Dan Rostenkowski. Dan Lassiter would get the bonds. He would become the broker for the bonds. He would transfer money back to ADFA. He never sold a bond. The money then would leave ADFA, go into one of the various banks for the specific bond loan, and they would zero it out. When they zeroed it out, they were giving it back to Lester, Lester handling fees. During the Lester investigation, we had numerous witnesses for the federal grand jury, uh, had extensive uh, testimony. Uh, people that was connected with Lester and drug use and everything else. Uh, his cocaine uh, use become used as a tool for sexual favors and also for uh, uh, business uh, uh, deals that influence people. Uh, and that's when uh, Mr. Uh, Lash become quite flamboyant with his cocaine use and then ultimately uh, led to his uh, arrest and conviction. Dan Lassiter, who was the best friend of Bill Clinton, who went to jail with Roger Clinton for cocaine. And by the way, let me explain something. He didn't sell cocaine. No, nope. they were giving it away. Huge piles of cocaine in his office. Ashtray upon ashtray full at the parties, and they would give it to young girls. 
That's sick. I mean, they were giving a highly addictive drug to young girls. One particular one comes to mind is a 14-year-old cheerleader uh, out of North Little Rock. Uh, she was uh, uh, a virgin, and ultimately he ended up um, uh, sending her to a physician of his. Uh, the physician put her on birth control pills. Um, he used cocaine in order to, uh, to uh, ultimately she lost her virginity and she got addicted to cocaine. And the last I heard of her, when we had her subpoenaed back to the federal grand jury, uh, she was a hooker in Lake Tahoe. Dan Laster contracted to launder the money. Now, in addition to his contract to launder the money and the system that he and Bill Clinton had set up to do it, probably what he did is he took advantage of some of the cocaine. That's why he could give it away. Shoot, you have 100 million a month in cocaine. They wouldn't care if you took a bucket full a day. After Laster was indicted, I started to uh, uh, receive quite a bit of harassment from, from my own department, Arkansas State Police. And I knew the reason behind it because uh, the affiliation with the State Police and the governor's office uh, with Dan Laster and his uh, business associates. Mr. Lassiter's Cocaine involvement at times was very heavy, then at times he was very cool, calm, mediocre. He didn't, he was, he was very careful as all of them have been for quite some time. Once he was convicted, he went to a minimum security prison, a holiday hotel we call him. He spent, I think it was six to eight months, and he got out. Unbeknownst to anybody. Bill Clinton, the day after he got out, granted him a full and complete pardon. So if you think he's tough on crime, think about a man that pardons a man that gives cocaine to kids. Fear of violence is robbing our children of their future. We must take away that fear and give them hope. We must give Alicia and all our children back their childhood. Working together, we can. Do something now. Call 1-800-WE-PREVENT. Your president, the president of the United States, not only was a part of a system that was laundering millions of cocaine dollars, your president signed off on it. He can't deny that he did. You see, because that, there's one little catch. Every loan at ADPA made, Bill Clinton himself had to sign off on it. More than Bill Clinton. You better identify the people in the loop of the drug running. You better identify the people in the loop for money laundering. And what you'll find there is those people go straight to Washington. Act 1062, if you look at it, it says that ADPA was developed and created to provide low interest bond loans for churches, schools, colleges. So now look what happened to our legislature. They voted on a bill creating ADPA thinking that they were getting money to colleges and schools to buy books and so forth. What better way to run thousands of tens of millions of dollars, launder it, clean it up, and use the cover of a state agency to do it? The first loan made at ADFA was made to Parkometer, a company called Parkometer. Seth Ward was the owner. As I started looking, I found out that the secretary treasurer was Webb Hubble. Then I find out Webb Hubble was Seth Ward's son-in-law. Guess who drafted the legislation creating Act 1062, which created the Arkansas Development Finance Authority? Webb Hubble. Guess who introduced the legislation to our legislators and got it passed through our house? Webb Hubble. Guess who got the first loan? Webb Hubble. Imagine this. Guess who did the audit and the evaluation of the application? Rose Law Firm, you guessed it. Who signed it? Webb Hubble, Hillary Clinton. You see, that's against the law in Arkansas. You can't investigate yourself when the good faith and credit of the state of Arkansas is involved in a bond issue. He broke the law. Good Lord, Will and Creek don't rise. Mr. Hubble will be serving some time in the pen for that one.
Ironically, Webb Hubble, a senior partner at the Rose Law Firm, was chairman of the Conflicts of Interest Committee at Rose. In 1988, he successfully advanced the Ethics in Government Act, which required Arkansas legislators to report governmental conflicts of interest. Incredibly, this law specifically exempted Governor Bill Clinton, his appointees, and his relatives. Clinton's appointment of Hubble to the U.S. Justice Department exemplified the administration's total disregard for legal ethics. Hubble's hasty resignation in March 1994 for overbilling of Rose clients was merely a ploy to remove Hubble from the limelight before extensive criminal charges could be brought against him. Let me tell you about Park on me. The first loan was $2.85 million. Never was a penny of that paid back. As the newspaper people started inquiring about the Parco Meter loans, what they found was that Parco Meter was actually building retrofit nose cone compartments that were being shipped to Mena. We find out that the nose cones were actually being used to smuggle dope back into the country. And what is scary, what's so scary, it's the same cast of characters. Webb Hubble, the Rose Law Firm, are guilty, I say to you, of conspiring to defraud the state of Arkansas, the federal government, and conspired to solicit the sales and the laundering of money for illegal drugs. This is your president. This is a circle of power. These are the people, when he got elected president, he did not pass go. He took them straight to Washington with him. And by all things holy, I think he was planning to set up and do the same thing in Washington. In 1982, cocaine trafficker Barry Seal set up one of the largest drug smuggling operations in the United States in Mena, Arkansas, under the approving eye of Governor Bill Clinton. Barry Seal had a bunch of planes and supposedly had pilots. Barry Seal was a, was a drug smuggler. Now, he tried to set it up in his home state of Louisiana, but they wouldn't let him. He had to come to a state that had a sleazy governor hooked on cocaine, and everybody knew it. Yeah, Bill Clinton was hooked on cocaine. I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? And uh, I worked at a club called La Bist La Bistros, and I met Roger Clinton there, uh, Governor Bill Clinton. Um, so a couple of the state troopers that went with him wherever he went, Roger Clinton uh, had came up to me and he had asked me, could I get him some coke, you know, and ask for my one hitter, which a one hitter is a very small silver device, okay, that you stick up into your nose and you just squeeze it and it a snort of cocaine and go up in there. And uh, I watched um, Roger hand what I had gave, given him to um, Governor Clinton and he just kind of turned around and walked off and that's one specific. Dr. Suen, uh, S-U-E-N, a uh, doctor at the medical center here in Little Rock has taken care of Bill Clinton for his sinus problems which may indeed be drug related to cocaine use um, as they destroy the sinus passages Governor Bill Clinton was taken into the hospital, I believe it was the medical center, on at least one or two occasions for cocaine uh, abuse and overdosage in which he actually had to be cared for at the hospital. It led to um, toga parties. Uh, and if you're not sure on what a toga party is, I've had to clarify this in the past. A uh, toga party is where you wrap yourself in a sheet uh, most of the time, uh, the people at the tog togo parties were um, Governor Clinton, now President Clinton, Attorney General um, Steve Clark. Okay, he was there a few times. Um, members of the Arkansas State Police, you know, along with Roger and you know other people, they began to 
dance around, do the cocaine in one room, have sex in another room, because in the coachman's inn, the rooms were adjoining, you know. And uh, to be quite truthful, you end up with somebody in particular, and you nine times out of ten end up having sex. And uh, there, co there was cocaine there. I, I know. I'm the, I'm the one that made sure it was there. I've talked to the manager, the assistant manager for the apartment complex where Roger Clinton used to live. They've all said Bill Clinton did drugs. They saw him. I've talked to a lot of other people who have all, just like the people at the apartment complex, said, hey, John, get us to a congressional hearing. Yes, we'll sign sworn affidavits. These people want to be sure when they come forward that something's done about it because they fear for their life, but they really want the truth to get out. I was there, we're coming there with Roger one night, and back in the um, back part of the mansion there, there's kind of like a living quarters type thing, and uh, we would all get together out there and um, do cocaine, you know, and uh, no, Miss Clinton wasn't there at the time. In uh, 1983, I was made aware that Sheriff Hathaway and one of his auxiliary deputies, Terry Capehart, were investigating a, uh, a smuggling operation going on at the Mena Airport. They had a, an inside source of information. Mr. Seal, um, it was our understanding, was the one who had brought the operation into the Mena Airport and that had initiated the beginning of the money laundering and the illegal activity. He said 1983 was his most profitable cocaine smuggling period ever. Uh, said that he, uh, the airplanes that he had placed at the main airport, there were four of them, a couple of Senecas and a couple of Panthers, and one or two stragglers uh, here and there, different airplanes. He said they were uh, purchased solely for the purpose of cocaine smuggling. There was, in my opinion, more than enough evidence to prosecute a number of people for crimes regarding the Barry Seal case at MENA. I snuck around, crawled through the bushes, thinking that I'd really have to hide to see them unloading the dope. Didn't have to. You could walk right up to the airport and they'd unload it right in front of you. They would unload it. They'd offload it. They didn't care. A uh, certain degree of money laundering had taken place uh, among these people that were associated with Barry Seal. What had not been done was to connect the dotted lines to ADPA. Because once you connected the dotted lines to ADPA, you had actually connected the dotted line to Clinton. In addition to the operations at MENA, small clearings in other parts of the state were used as drop points for money and cocaine. They had special uh, uh, cargo doors installed in the side without FAA permission uh, so that these uh, doors could be opened in flight. They'd uh, pull in, slide back, and, and the cocaine could be dropped out of the side in flight. When you have a public which is aware of an ongoing criminal enterprise, which when you have an international cocaine smuggler who is high profile and a lot of people know that they are operating in a small area, a lot of people knew about the money laundering. Uh, it was common gossip on the street because it was so blatant. And they see investigations ongoing for several years and they keep watching for indictments. They know grand juries are convening. They know that witnesses are supposed to be providing evidence to a grand jury, yet year after year after year, no indictments are returned. People lose confidence in the system. Clinton had integrated a number of corrupt cops, judges, and politicians into high-level positions to ensure the continued success of the drug smuggling, money laundering operations. All was going well, until a fateful night in the fall of 1987. On August 22nd, 1987, Kevin had spent the night with his friend Don Henry. They left uh, Don's home around 12.30 or quarter to one uh, on the 23rd of August in early morning hours, and uh, the next thing we knew, they had been run over by a train. There seems to be a small airstrip in the area. There have been sightings and uh, reports of small airplanes flying very low with lights off in the area. I believe they saw something they shouldn't have seen. 
Three weeks later, their deaths were ruled accidental by the state medical examiner, Fami Malik, and um, we disagreed with that ruling uh, because we thought the evidence pointed to homicide. Uh, at that point, we had a lot of questions and no answers, uh, and the facts didn't add up to what he was telling us, so we decided to get a second opinion and uh, met with resistance from all fronts, both with our local law enforcement, with the state crime lab, uh, with everybody that we turned to. Uh, we obtained court orders uh, we, requesting samples of everything that the crime lab had for a second opinion. And uh, Femi Malik um, uh, resisted court orders. Uh, he refused to obey them. Ultimately, it was proven that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' skull had been crushed prior to the placement of their bodies on the railroad tracks. However, Malik stood by his ruling that the boys had simply fallen asleep on the tracks. Malik had been kept in office at the insistence of Governor Clinton for a number of years, despite vigorous public outcry to have him removed. As long as Malik's rulings pleased the governor's office or state police, they were left to stand, no matter how implausible. Malik's obvious lack of medical knowledge reached a pinnacle when he ruled that James Milam, who had been decapitated, had died of natural causes. Yet Clinton, who had the power to remove Malik from office, insisted he stay. There were allegations of tampering with evidence in murder cases. Uh, there were allegations of perjury in different cases. It didn't seem to matter what Malik did, Clinton uh, protected him. He made excuses such as he's overworked, uh, he's just stressed out, he's underpaid. Uh, they gave him a $14,000 raise, which was an insult uh, to my family as well as a lot of others in the state who um, to this day are struggling with asinine rulings and the deaths of children and other loved ones. I was outraged that protecting a political crony of Clinton's was more important than the fact that two young boys had been murdered. Dan Harmon was just a local attorney in, in the town of Benton, Arkansas. And uh, after Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed and their bodies placed on the tracks and run over by a train, he approached Linda Ives and the Henry family about trying to help them. He's a manipulator. Gives a great closing argument in court. He's been trained for years to play the game. He knows how to do it. He's very good at it. Mr. Harmon can win your confidence and make you think he's the greatest guy in the world. He did that to Linda Ives. He helped lead them down a path that absolutely led to nowhere on this case. I got involved in the case and immediately Harmon uh, tried to discredit me without even knowing me. Couldn't figure it out. I run across a young lady named Charlene Wilson who told a horror story that I didn't really believe at the time. So I started searching for evidence to substantiate just part of what she had said. Herman went ballistic. Uh, called, he threatened me, threatened Sheriff Pridgen, threatened Captain Gene Donham, the chief deputy all because I talked to this one woman. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle. I do know that the boys were watching the drop site, okay? And they got curious as to what was being dropped there. The fact is, we know who killed these kids. The whole reason this case, it's been slowed down, stopped, wherever we're at. They can't do anything with it as long as Clinton's in office because it tracks right back to Bill Clinton being involved in the cover-up. He took care of everybody that ever covered anything up in this case. Everybody got promoted.
A number of people approached the police with information about Don and Kevin's murders and consequently were murdered themselves. Shortly before Keith McCaskill was murdered, he, he knew that he was fixing to be murdered. He told his family goodbye, told his friends goodbye. Um, the night of um, elections in 1988, uh, he took two pennies out of his pocket and threw them on the bar there at the wagon wheel and said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And he was murdered that night. Uh, Jeff Rhodes was a young man from Benton who uh, uh, was murdered in 1989. Um, shortly before his death, he made a phone call to his dad in Texas and told him he needed to get out of Benton, Arkansas, that uh, he felt he knew too much about the boys on the railroad tracks and uh, the death of Keith McCaskill. Uh, a couple of weeks later, Jeff was found dead. Uh, he'd been shot in the head. Uh, they'd attempted to cut off his head and hands and feet, set him on fire in a dump. A total of six people with information about the boys' murders were eventually murdered as well. well Gene Duffy was the head of the uh, 7th Judicial District Drug Task Force. She was leading a team of uh, narcotics investigators into a drug trail in Saline County that led her right straight to Dan Harmon. This information she shared with the 1990 Federal OSADEF team that was investigating and targeting corruption and drugs in Saline County in Central Arkansas. From her involvement in that, she was literally threatened, forced to leave the state of Arkansas and go into hiding. I had no idea just how dangerous certain elected officials thought me to be until a brutal media campaign was launched against me. For months, there were daily allegations of everything from misspending funds to ordering illegal arrests. Every attempt was made to keep me from running the drug task force. We were even shut down completely for several weeks during a bogus state police investigation. In spite of crippling disruptions, the task force was making significant discoveries about drug trafficking in central Arkansas some of which led to the very people who were conducting the massive media crusade against me. We discovered that drug trafficking in Arkansas was linked to government officials in frightening proportions. A great number of people came to me with testimony about astonishing criminal activity of very high-level public officials. Many were willing to testify before the federal grand jury. Robert Govar and Chuck Banks were the U.S. attorneys for the District of Arkansas at that time. I was subpoenaed to testify on behalf of the drug trafficking and the cartel, more or less, is what it was, uh, that had to do with Dan Harmon and what I call company, because there are a whole, uh, there's a whole bunch of them that are involved. I was asked quite in depth about the drug trafficking that went on with Dan Harmon, um, Mr. Clinton, Roger Clinton. Although there was an abundance of evidence and word kept reaching me from members of the grand jury that they were ready to indict, no indictments came. Mr. Govar also insisted that he was ready to prosecute at least two key figures, but the holdup was his boss, U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks who repeatedly delayed requests for indictments. Harmon had paid a visit to Chuck Banks, the U.S. District Attorney, who was in charge of that district. It's recorded, he signed in. He was there approximately 30 minutes, and up until that time, everything appeared to be running fine with the grand jury. Then, in November, Banks removed Govar from the case, and I was fired from the task force. From this point, the ordeal turned really ugly. In January 1991, one of the key targets of Govar's investigation, Dan Harmon, took office as the 7th Judicial District Prosecutor. Harmon immediately called a state grand jury to investigate the allegations against me. To avoid being jailed in Hot Spring County, which would have put me in serious danger, I left the state. In the meantime, Banks, who had taken over the federal investigation, attempted to give the appearance of carrying the investigation forward while systematically destroying it. He harassed witnesses, 
suppressed evidence, and finally announced in February of 1991 that the investigation had disclosed no credible witnesses or evidence against any public official. I received a phone call, uh, and they told me that um, I had made a very big mistake. And I was assured by the U.S. Attorney's Office that my name, that my, my testimony, that my statements, that the people that were on that witness list would never, ever be revealed. Well, ha ha, you know, someone in the U.S. Attorney's Office had given Mr. Harmon a list of the effective witnesses, you know. Some of them witnesses over a period of time have came up dead and or missing or have never been heard of again. That don't give you a very good feeling. I'm scared of these people. I'm very scared of them. Guess who arrested her? Dan Harmon. The very guy that she says turned her on to drugs now has her arrested. Dan Harmon, he walked to me, handed me what was supposed to be a search warrant, and he said, bitch, excuse me for saying that, I told you, if you ever, ever brought my name up or brought anything up about the past dealings that we've had, that I'd take you down. He said, you're going to prison. I'm going to put you in prison. He did. I'm here. I mean, I, I've watched second, third offense people walk around with probation on top of probation on top of probation. Not this lady. First time she's been arrested for drugs. They allege that they found in her home. She gets 30 years. Sure, everybody ought to be able to see through this. This is a man that told Linda I was for years. We're going to get to the bottom of your son's death. But yet when I start making progress, it looks like the people I talk to starts getting time in the penitentiary. Linda says it's business as usual in Sling County. Justice is in the English language that can describe how usual in Arkansas. There aren't any words that makes you feel as a parent or as a sister um, are capable of doing. Um, you know, I think we were just kind of uh, naive, um, common, ordinary people. Got up and went to work every day and came home and went to bed uh, and assumed that everybody else did the same thing and tried to do what was right. And uh, I think Kevin's death has been uh, the rudest awakening that anybody could ever have uh, to see what really goes on. I can provide information that has tentacles to Governor Clinton's administration. It is apparent to me that a congressional investigation is the last hope, not only for the people of Arkansas, implications of illegal activity president who has left in his wake and now vulnerable to the powers of a president, but for the people of our nation who are now vulnerable to the powers of a president who has left in his wake and implications of illegal activities and serious improprieties. Meanwhile, Welch and Duncan's investigation into the operation at MENA was about to derail. We'd been so busy investigating, just concentrating, focusing, that uh, it took a while to register that uh, nothing was going to happen. We could not understand what was happening. Neither Mr. Welch nor I and were ever subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury and present massive amounts of evidence of wrongdoing by associates of Barry Seal. No indictments were ever returned against any of the individuals. And I can tell you there was extensive evidence. There definitely was, was some suppression of evidence and definitely a cover-up of an investigation. And somebody should be held accountable as to why that happened. Not one major cocaine bust was ever made in Arkansas out of Mena, Arkansas. Now imagine that, 10 years nearly in its running, never one truckload ever got caught. During the 
1992 Attorney General's race in Arkansas, a member of Clinton's staff had approached Winston Bryant and had asked him to stay away from the MENA affair or the MENA matter. I've done quite a bit of investigation in the MENA. Uh, uh, Barry After um, Winston, uh, quite frankly, it is a federal problem. He took office. Bill told me that uh, he was no longer allowed to discuss um, the MENA airport investigation from um, the Attorney General's office. Uh, the Attorney General's office uh, is not uh, like most Attorney General's offices across the country. We do not have the authority to convene a grand jury and initiate criminal prosecution. A lot of people have said that the MENA operation stopped in 1986 when Barry Seal was gunned down. It's not true. Uh, covert operations are still going on in MENA, Arkansas today. Now, if you stop and think, back when Bill Clinton was governor, he was asked about MENA. He said, well, well that's a federal problem. I'm, I'm not going to get involved in it. Well, he's not the governor of Arkansas anymore. He's the president of the United States. If we still have operations at MENA, Arkansas, this is his golden opportunity to take care of it. My question is, why doesn't he? I've always thought it was a wonderful thing to be able to serve your country uh, as a federal law enforcement agent. And for 15 years, I did not encounter anything like the corruption which I encountered after the main investigations began. President Clinton's verbal commitment to a war on drugs has been negated by his actions. During his first weeks in office, Clinton revoked random drug testing for White House staff members. He eliminated 121 positions at the Office of National Drug Control, and he appointed Jocelyn Elders as U.S. Surgeon General, despite her well-known desire to legalize drugs. One of Hillary's investments, under the direction of Tyson Foods counselor James Blair, netted almost $100,000 on an initial $1,000 investment on nearly impossible feet using legal methods. I can't read their minds or speculate, but I had absolutely no reason to believe that I got any favorable treatment. Coincidentally, Governor Clinton enacted a number of state regulations allowing Tyson Foods to grow into the largest industry in Arkansas. Don Tyson put in six, seven hundred thousand dollars all told in all of Bill Clinton's campaign. Guess what he got out of it? He got ten million dollars. Guess from where? The Arkansas Development Finance Authority. And he never paid a dime for it. I had heard rumors of Don Tyson and his alleged uh, cocaine use and uh, distribution. And I went through the intelligence files and come up with enough that I thought was sufficient amount of evidence to launch an investigation on Mr. Tyson out simply out of the Arkansas State Police intelligence files has been accumulated for years. A great deal of criminal investigation files were surfacing with Don Tyson's name mentioned in there as uh, being involved with some drug and narcotics uh, trafficking activities. So I interviewed some of the investigators who worked on the Tyson case. Most of them felt that Tyson should have been indicted, but uh, the investigations were always um, uh, sabotaged, uh, oftentimes from within. One particular uh, undercover narc agent told me that uh, uh, another criminal investigator in that department named Doug Fogley was furnishing Don Tyson with photographs of the undercover narcotics agents that were working on his case. Donald Smaltz was actually hired to look into the allegations that Tyson had given bribes to different people, specifically to the Secretary of Ag Agriculture, Mike Espy. And what came out of that investigation was very remarkable. Drug abuse, um, drug distribution, money laundering, even murder for hire. Now, Smaltz collected all this stuff. He compiled it, he put it in proper order. Then he approached Janet Reno and said, look, 
You know, I need to broaden my investigation. I'm finding more here than just simple payoffs. What do you think happened? Well, by now, most of you already know. He was turned down. Just exactly what we expected to happen, happened. I mean, Tyson already hired lobbyists, um, attorneys, who all approached Congress trying to get everybody to stop Smaltz. Why is it in this country today that if you've got a little money, you walk away? Why is it you can create the pressure to stop investigations? And I promise you, Janet Reno has stopped this one. You look at these and you wonder, how could this happen? You know, how does someone elude prosecution with reams of investigative reports? How does it get stopped? Some say it's Bill Clinton. Don Tyson was in the middle of the cocaine just like Bill Clinton, just like Dan Lester, just like Roger Clinton, and all the others. So you see, all of this incest and all of this drug running, all of the trafficking of drugs, sending them all over the nation, came out of Little Mina, Arkansas, right under the nose of little Governor Billy Clinton, I went to Bill, and I said, Bill, you've got two weeks to tell the truth, or I'm going to tell it. You're breaking the law, and I can't be a part of it. You made a mistake. I'm not one of your buds, or at least I'm not that big a buddy. When Larry Nichols made his disclosures, made them public, the Clinton spin doctors treated him unmercifully. It shocked those of us who had been kept in the dark through the years in Arkansas politics. The Arkansas news media had done little, if anything, to uncover anything derogatory about Bill Clinton. And for these disclosures to come out of the blue was so shocking that the spin doctors attacked the messenger rather than tried to, answer, tried to answer the charges that Nichols had made. And they did such an efficient job that it caused me and others to look with less than favor on Larry Nichols as an individual because all we knew about him was what they were telling and the press was printing. One of the neatest things about Bill Clinton is how he handles the media. You see, Bill Clinton's an attorney. And when a witness comes out against his client, what's the first thing an attorney does? He tries to discredit that witness. They accuse me of everything under the sun, day in, day out. Every week, every week, there was some new scandal in the paper that I was involved in. Six, eight weeks later, they print a retraction. It wasn't me. But to this day, people in Arkansas think that I'm some evil person. As a result of that, uh, the boy had to pay a high penalty in his credibility. He had to, had to pay a high penalty in his acceptability. And then when the new evidence came out that supported everything that Larry Nichols had said, he finds himself, I think, probably in the position of knowing that he had been exonerated, but he has not been exonerated in the minds of the people generally, in my view. And he finds himself probably in the position of wondering where he goes now to get his good name back. A lot of people wonder how Bill Clinton could control a state the size of Arkansas with the absolute authority that he did. It's not hard. You see, after 12 years, after kissing the people that have the money, Bill Clinton controlled the legal system. He controlled the judges. He controlled the attorneys. He controlled the banks. It's just a small state, a one-party state. What tends to happen in small states like that, I think, is the longer the person remains governor, that uh, I think the greater the abuses are. and. Uh, I think the abuses were very, very widespread under Bill Clinton. One thing that's very difficult for people to understand, Bill Clinton 
doesn't care about money. He cares about power. All he needed ADFA to do was to channel money to the big players financially. I got tickled when the reporters during the campaign came here. They were looking, trying to find out where Bill Clinton profited. He didn't. He profited by putting money into his friends' pockets. The way they were doing these bond issues and just the whole political atmosphere, quite frankly, uh, was a scandal. But that's the way things had historically been done in Arkansas. But imagine this, imagine the power this man has in Washington, D.C. Imagine what he can do to this nation if he gets that circle of power going there, as he did here. Nothing I can do, nothing you can do can stop him. Because he'll have the absolute power, and believe me, he will use it to have you investigated, to have you arrested, to have uh, your company audited. Now, that's what'll happen when his circle of power is complete. When I worked at ADFA, it was not uncommon for Bob Nash to call me up and say, hey, Nichols, the governor needs about five grand transferred to his travel account so he can go see his ladies. And we would at ADFA transfer five to $10,000 for him to go see his girlfriends in either LA or New York. He'd use so much travel money to go see women out of his regular travel budget, he would even have to borrow money from ADFA, not to mention the fact that ADFA's budget was not quite as scrutinized as the governor's budget. But he literally used money, ad for money, the people of Arkansas, taxpayers' money, to conduct liaisons. During the 1990 Arkansas gubernatorial race, Larry Nichols, in a last-ditch attempt to alert the public, boldly filed a lawsuit against Bill Clinton. As expected, the lawsuit was eventually quashed, sealed, and illegally dismissed by a Clinton-appointed judge. What Nichols didn't expect was a complete media blackout of the facts he presented. Back in 1990, after all the damage they had done to me, I did something that most people wouldn't do in Arkansas. I sued Bill Clinton. Now, it's very important to note that in that lawsuit, I brought out the names of five women. On October the 19th, the only press conference I've ever held in my life was on the Capitol steps of Arkansas. Every news organization in Arkansas, newspaper, TV, radio, were there on the steps. I read the names of the five women. I read and talked about ADPA. No one had ever made such a cold, callous statement against Bill Clinton where he named the women. When I got through with the press conference, I went through the center door and I walked out with the camera crews with me, and I walked all the way to the end to the governor's office. And I left the press release right on the governor's secretary's desk. And not one bit of the press release made it into the local TV or the local newspapers anywhere. It didn't show up anywhere. The reason I tell you that is because in those days, he had the circle of power complete in Arkansas. Eventually, every allegation stemming from Nichols' 1990 lawsuit and press conference would prove valid regarding Clinton's taxpayer financed sexual liaisons, his drug usage, and his criminal activities relating to ADFA and Whitewater. Gradually, the women who had carried on adulterous affairs with Clinton began to emerge. The first was Jennifer Flowers, who, like all those close to Clinton, was faced with a decision. Either keep quiet and receive a government job, or go public and face character assassination in the press. Betsy Wright, Clinton's former chief of staff, admitted she had been hired to conduct media smear campaigns against anyone planning to tell the truth about the governor's sexual habits. She was prepared to go after at least 26 women who had the potential of destroying Clinton's chance at the presidency. During the 1992 presidential campaign, uh, I was getting bludgeoned by the media because Jennifer Flowers had come out of my lawsuit. A man called me on the phone on a Monday. His name was Gary Johnson. He was an attorney. He told me that he felt bad because I was being bludgeoned and he wanted to talk to me about handling my case. Well, I was craving an attorney, any attorney to help me. You know, I saw Larry out there doing battle, so to speak, on his own, and I felt like he needed some help. I met him on a Tuesday. He was a special attorney. I didn't even know it. You see, he lived next door to Jennifer Flowers. 
For security purposes, Gary Johnson had installed a video camera near the front door of his Quapaw Tower condominium. Looking at someone in front of my door, it got a perfect shot of them in front of uh, uh, Jennifer Flowers' condominium. And it wasn't my intention ever to uh, take pictures of Bill Clinton going in to see Jennifer Flowers. I could care less who Bill Clinton goes to see. Uh, but it just so happened she lived next door to me, and I mounted the camera there. Guess what he caught on tape? Bill Clinton walking into Jennifer Flowers' apartment on numerous occasions with a key. I actually saw him go into her condominium. Uh, it wasn't that I was standing there looking out my peephole watching Jennifer Flowers' condominium. It had nothing to do with Bill Clinton. It's just that uh, I had got, I got the camera. I had the camera before Jennifer Flowers moved in. And when she moved in, she just happened to have some very interesting house guests. Go back to 60 Minutes when Bill and Hillary were loving kisses. They stood up and lied, and Bill said that he'd never been to her apartment, that he'd only called her once from the kitchen and from his office. That's an absolute lie, and these tapes proved it. The 60 Minutes interview had been designed specifically to save Clinton's campaign, not necessarily to get to the truth. And they came to us because they were in big trouble in New Hampshire. They were about to lose right there, and they needed some first aid. They needed some bandaging. They needed, what they needed was a paramedic. So they came to us, and we did it, and that's what they wanted to do. When I told Tim Russert that I was persona non grata at the White House, he said, why? I said, the Jennifer Flowers interview. He said, you got him the nomination. I said, I know that. As far as I know from the conversations I've had, Bernie Nussbaum knew that, Gergen knows that, Lloyd Cutler certainly knows it, because Lloyd had a hand in his coming on there that night. You know, it was strong medicine, the way I edited it. He was a very sick candidate. He needed very strong medicine. And I'm not in the business of doctoring candidates, but he got up out of a sickbed that night and walked to the nomination. And as I said to Mandy, you know, if I had edited it your way, you know where you'd be today? You'd still be up in New Hampshire looking for the nomination. He became the candidate that night. When the Jen Flowers story broke, that story was a hundred times more creditable than the story that literally knocked Gary Hart out of the campaign. I had been Jennifer Flowers' neighbor. I knew that Bill Clinton wasn't telling the truth about that. Uh, Bill Clinton, I think, would, would do just about anything to, uh, to save his political hide. He got threatened, phone calls. He asked me, he said, well, they hurt me. I said, well, they hadn't hurt me. I don't know why I didn't worry more about that. Basically, what they said was, uh, you mind your own business. Um, and all it did was made me mad. Uh, I, I, would, I never thought in a million years that anybody would follow up on it. We filed the request for the subpoenas on Thursday. S Saturday morning, we found Gary Johnson beaten and left for dead. And without getting into gory details, both elbows were dislocated, his collarbones were broken, his uh, spleen and his bladder were ruptured with holes the size of half dollars in them. His nose and sinus cavities were all crushed. He had been beaten by Clinton's people. Were they very large? Yes. <laughs> yes, they were. Did they say, where's the tape? Yes, they asked me for the tape. And what's sick is the man gave them the tapes, and then they went and broke his elbows, punctured his spleen, punctured his bladder. They looked like state troopers, I'll say that.
Clinton can be a very dangerous individual in the state of Arkansas. In my lawsuit in 1990, I named the lady Sally Perdue as having an affair with Bill Clinton. Sally had an apartment in Little Rock, and the Clinton security guards would drop him off at her apartment and go park in the woods. When Clinton got through doing his business, he was flick their porch light, and they'd know to come and get him. She started coming out, started talking. Well, believe it or not, before she could talk, Clinton's people got to her and offered her a federal job or break her legs, whichever one was the best. Sally Perdue, former Miss Arkansas and radio talk show host, carried on a sexual relationship with Governor Clinton between August and December 1983. State troopers and government vehicles were used at taxpayer expense to shuttle Clinton back and forth to Sally's home. Perdue, who today supervises a home for people with Down syndrome, was offered a $60,000 a year federal job to keep quiet. She refused. You see, that's illegal. You can't offer a federal job to get someone to hush. Following her attempt to go public, Miss Perdue lost her job and started receiving threatening phone calls and letters. Live ammunition was found on the seat of her car, and the rear window of her vehicle was shot out. Even though a number of witnesses have corroborated her story, the American press has refused to print it. During the 1992 presidential campaign, interviews with ABC and NBC, as well as an appearance on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, were taped, but were never aired. She had actually been on the Sally Jesse Raphael show right after the New York primary. Did you know the TV stations around the country blacked out that program and wouldn't show it? In December 1993, former bodyguards of Bill Clinton came forward with detailed information regarding the governor's sexual encounters with a number of women. Larry Patterson and Roger Perry, both veteran Arkansas troopers, boldly spoke on the record. Two other troopers who initially spoke off the record were later identified as Danny Ferguson and Ronnie Anderson. In April 1994, a fifth trooper, L.D. Brown, came forward and corroborated their stories, adding that Clinton's sexual partners numbered over 100 during the period he was employed by the governor. The trooper's official duties included approaching women to obtain their phone numbers for Clinton, driving him to rendezvous points in state vehicles, guarding him during sexual encounters, securing hotel rooms, and lying to Hillary about his whereabouts. Phone logs and other corroborating evidence fully back these reports. I saw on several occasions uh, Bill Clinton engaging in sexual acts uh, while I was either blocking the road or working security at the governor's mansion. Uh, I saw them with my own eyes take place. So it's not a rumor, it is firsthand. The entire conversation inside a vehicle in a two hour drive to from one point to another would be totally about sex and women are jokes. He would actually ask people how they performed oral sex on women in cars. I'd been in that conversation. He would ask if you had ever had two to three women at one time in one bed, things like this. Bill Clinton was obsessed with that. The first or second time that you're with him and you're alone and you see some attractive woman, he would say, hey, Larry, what would you like to do to her? And, you know, this is the governor of the state of Arkansas. The majority of his off time was spent trying to figure out ways to be with women that he wanted to be with. Uh, he was more discreet during a campaign year than he was in a r routine year as governor an off year. We were required to work overtime so we could sit outside someplace and block the road or sit in some driveway or sit at some, you know, uh, apartment complex while he went in to take care of his, uh, his female friends. Uh, you know, state money was utilized. He had certain troopers that he used for certain women and um, Larry Patterson and Danny Ferguson were used for uh, two women in particular. He would tell you, Larry, see the blonde-headed lady in the green outfit? Go get her. 
name and her telephone number for me. He would say, she has that come hither look. And that was verbiage that he used quite often. And on several occasions, I had gone out into the crowd. I never had one of the females to refuse to give me her name and her address. On uh, one occasion, it was a Christmas parade of 1989 in a small town in uh, northeast Arkansas. And uh, he picked a lady out of the crowd and asked me to find out who she was. He just carried on about how beautiful she was, how good looking she was, uh, uh, how big her breasts were and things like that. And I found out that she was interested in a state job. And um, she gave me her name and number and I said, well, maybe the governor will call you or can I call you? And uh, when we got in the card, I gave the governor her name with her phone number and I said, you'll like this. She's interested in a state job. And he said, oh, good, 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 good. The next time I saw that lady, she was working for Bill Clinton in his presidential campaign uh, the night he announced. Uh, his candidacy for president. I was told by Bill Clinton that this was part of my job to keep people from finding out about his affairs. Most of the women that Bill Clinton had uh, sexual affairs with were well taken care of. Uh, they have good jobs or their husbands ended up with good jobs. Uh, they were um, well taken care of and the actual time spent trying to cover up these affairs while he was governor was nothing like it was when he announced that he was running for president. In an attempt to silence the officers, the Clinton administration launched an elaborate counterattack, which included urging Ferguson to change his story and levying false accusations of insurance fraud against Perry and Patterson. When Larry Patterson and Roger Perry came out, Clinton's security guards, they substantiated everything that I'd alleged in the lawsuit. These people were there, they were just bodyguards. But watch what happened. The same thing that happened to me, they planned to do it to them. They roasted them in the media. They said they were committing insurance fraud. The evidence of uh, that these state policemen have brought forward relative to Clinton's, Clinton's womanizing it's being questioned by the spin doctors as not being credible. Yet, it is more credible than the evidence on 90% of the people who are, who are confined now on death row across America. Is this fair? Did y'all see the papers saying that the troopers were telling the truth and were found innocent? Air to the stories they were telling? have a basis, since they're not the scumbags that the spin doctors for Clinton tried to make them out to be? These two have, have had the courage to come forward, and the evidence that they have presented uh, has not only been creditable, but it's been overwhelming. And the truth is, I'm convinced that it's just the tip of the iceberg. On May 8, 1991, Paula Jones, a state employee with the Arkansas Industrial Development Commission, was working the registration desk for the governor's quality management conference at the Excelsior Hotel. Governor Bill Clinton was to be the main speaker. I was approached by one of Bill Clinton's bodyguards named Danny Ferguson, and I was given a number, and I asked him what it was. I held out my hand, and he said, it's a number to a hotel room that the uh, governor would like to meet with me. Well, I was surprised, and, and I kind of talked it over with my with my coworker, and uh, we we didn't have any reason to believe that we couldn't trust him. So I I agreed to go on up to the room and meet with Mr. Bill Clinton. I got to the room, and Governor Clinton he opened the door to meet me. It was a room that did not have any beds in it. It had couches and stuff like that. It was more like a meeting type room. And he had asked me about my job and how I liked it and who my boss was, and, and I told him. And he mentioned that he liked the way that my curves were on my body, and he liked the way that my hair went down my back, the middle of my back. 
and then he tried to lean over and he grabbed, he started to put his hand up my leg, which I, I just, it happened so fast. And he tried to, to kiss me on the neck. He, it happened so fast, but he tried to bend over and kiss me on the neck as he was putting his hand up my leg. And I backed off, I said, I don't want to do this. And I said, I think I need to be going. And then he got up before I even knew it and dropped his pants. And Bill Clinton asked me to perform oral sex on him which I declined, and I jumped up, and I told him I need to go immediately. That's when he went to say, if you have any trouble whatsoever, you have hey, Dave Harrington, your boss, contact me immediately. I said, well, I'm leaving, and I started to proceed down the hall to, to the door, and he followed behind me, said if we could try to keep this between ourselves. And I went down the elevator, went back to my registration desk, and I told Pam the whole story. I can't understand how somebody can take advantage of somebody like that. And, and then they have the audacity to drop his, drop his pants. I mean, you know. I'm not going to dignify this by com com commenting on it. Paula gave the exclusive to the Washington Post and uh, Mike Isikoff. We were going to be as open as we could with the Washington Post. And Mike uh, told Paula that as far as he was concerned that he believed Paula and that he thought it was a, the story should be told. And Mike said they were ready to, uh, to put the story out. And they were going to go to the editors and present the story to him. We heard that Mike got suspended from the Washington Post. And there was a big fallout between the editors of the Washington Post and, and Mike. Paula Jones filed a lawsuit against President Clinton, claiming sexual harassment. The same day, a massive media smear campaign against Paula Jones was launched. Think about a man that has no more regard for women than Bill Clinton does. They're just sex things. I don't understand the feminist movement being behind Bill Clinton. He hangs women on his wall like trophies. A number of women who have had sexual relationships with Bill Clinton have allegedly been given major career boosts in exchange for silence. Beth Colson received a judicial appointment to the Arkansas Court of Appeals from Clinton. Regina Blakely landed a job with CBS National in Washington covering the White House. Likewise, Deborah Mathis secured a lucrative job with the White House Press Corps. Susan Whitaker was made the liaison between the Arkansas State Capitol and the White House. Elizabeth Ward obtained a position with the Clinton's close friends, Hollywood producers Harry Thomason and Linda Bloodworth Thomason. And Joe Jenkins was given a high-level position with AP&L. One of the most harrowing stories of Clinton's attempt to keep his promiscuity hidden involves Jerry Parks, a private investigator and former chief of security for Clinton's campaign headquarters. My father was uh, Luther Gerald Parks, AKA Jerry Parks. He was the head of Clinton's security for Clinton's inaugural campaign wherever he was running for president. My father was brutally murdered at Chennault Parkway and Arkansas Highway 10 in one of the most elite parts of Little Rock, Arkansas. Someone pulled aside alongside him and started sh shooting at him. They cornered him, stopped him on Highway 10 as he was turning left onto Highway 10 off Chanel Parkway. They stepped out of the car after blocking his path. He was shot five times, once in the leg, once in the arm, three times in the chest. My father had a file on Bill Clinton's infidelity and his affairs that ran from approximately 82, 83 to somewhere between till about 90 to 91. The file consisted of pictures, um, time, dates, places of where Bill Clinton was at, where Roger Clinton was at, um, the type of drug use that Bill Clinton and Roger Clinton were involved in. I was the only person that would ever go with him when he would do his private investigative work. And I remember four to five times that I was with him, and that's what he was keying on. I saw Clinton with a lot of different women, a lot of different types, sizes, shapes, colors, one of them being Jennifer Flowers. You know, I was just like, wow. It was, it was more neat than anything else that, you know, somebody that is this famous, this big wig, can get away with this. This just blew my mind. Shortly before Jerry's death, the phone lines at his home were cut, the security system was disconnected, and the Clinton files were stolen. I believe my father was assassinated because he was, he was, the, he was the one link that could actually close everything and completely shut Clinton down. 
I feel that Bill Clinton had my father killed to save his political career. When I did contact Little Rock Special Investigative Services, they told me that they had been pulled off the case three weeks prior to that. Um, that just blows my mind on how when they, I hear they're making progress, all of a sudden they're pulled off the case. Something's not right there. Bill Clinton has been the way he is ever since I've known him. He hasn't changed. He will not change. Uh, people inside the White House today tell me that he's uh, running sexcapades in and out of the White House like have never been there before. It's a disgrace to America. If we had known his background, the people of Arkansas would have ne never elected him governor of this state. And I charge the media of this state for not doing their duty and exposing these things that have, in, have since become matters of fact. He's a womanizing, dope smoking, liar, and a draft dodger. I don't remember those being in the Constitution as exactly the model qualities we want in a president. I think the media has been part of the covering up of uh, uh, the actual true story of and character of Bill Clinton. I believed with all my heart that the American people had the right to know uh, what they had been sold. Uh, Bill Clinton is not the person that they voted for. Voters who depend on the media for unbiased information regarding political candidates have been betrayed. Much of the information concerning ADFA, Whitewater, and Clinton's sexual promiscuity was known by the media as early as 1990 yet was kept hidden. The media's heavy pro-Clinton bias prior to the 1992 election was best summed up by Newsweek when they candidly stated, truth is, the press is willing to cut Clinton some slack because they like him and what he has to say. In May 1994, Newsweek added, the national press has been restrained in its accounts of Bill Clinton's private life and with good reason. Most of those who have made charges against him have been despicable people jealous and stunted sorts. What an indictment about the media. You knew the truth about Bill Clinton. You just didn't like George Bush. I know Bill Clinton, probably as well as anybody. We used to train him on how to look straight into a camera and lie through his teeth. And you see, part of Bill's pathological lying is the fact that we've taught him how to believe the lie that he's telling. And once he believes the lie, then he can sell it to you as the truth. The world is at risk when the commander-in-chief of the United States of America is a man that will look at another government who will make trade deals and lie through his teeth. Clinton could get us involved in a hopeless quagmire uh, easily in Europe, in Africa, in North Korea, in any number of places, because not only of his ineptness and his lack of understanding, but his contempt for military things. This goes back at least as far as the 60s in his college days, when he not only attended and participated in anti-American rallies, but organized them. Uh, back in the, and, and incidentally, those were not anti-war rallies. Those were anti-American rallies. He has no loyalty to this nation. He has no loyalty to its fighting men. He has not enough integrity to have any loyalty to its population. He knows how to say the right things, but he has lied for so long that I really don't think he knows the difference anymore between the lie and the truth. Bill Clinton was a dishonest on a daily basis. I mean, uh, there's more dishonesty in his life than there is honesty. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, maybe being a politician in these days and times, you have to tell one group of people what they want to hear and another group what they want to hear. And if the truth conflicts, then, then, then so be it. The media has not been able to ascertain today that there's a human being sitting in the presidential chair of the United States of America that lies with everything he says. They still believe somehow in the office of the presidency. They still believe there's some integrity there. Attempts to keep the criminal activities of Whitewater concealed from the public were largely successful prior to the 1992 election. After that, however, the raging Whitewater Rapids could no longer be contained. What the Clintons claimed as a simple money-losing investment was in actuality 
a series of complex business transactions and cover-ups, ultimately costing the American taxpayer more than $60 million. When this is all over, it's going to be the same story we've been telling for two years. We made a bad investment, we lost money, um, and there's really not much more to add to it. We have and we have enforced higher standards against the uh, ethical conflicts than any previous administration. Whitewater may have begun as a legitimate real estate venture, but it came to be used to skim, directly or indirectly, federally insured deposits from an SNL and a small business investment corporation. When each failed, the United States taxpayer became obligated to pick up the tab. Two, the family of the former governor of Arkansas received value from Whitewater well in excess of resources invested. Three, taxpayer guaranteed funds were in all likelihood used to benefit the campaign of a former governor. Four, the in independence of the United States government's regulatory system has been flagrantly violated in an effort to protect a single American citizen. People should not be able to raise questions and erode people's moral authority in this country. It quickly became obvious that Whitewater would engulf the Clinton administration if ignored. A twofold counterattack was put into action. The first was to win sympathy from the conservative populace, who were among his chief critics. Clinton embarked on a series of appearances, heartily promoting himself as a born-again Christian who supports and practices traditional biblical family values. While the uninformed may have been fooled, those who realized what was happening were outraged at the blatant hypocrisy. This is a place where I have come to seek divine guidance and support and reassurance. You know, after Bill Clinton was in office for two days, he signed five executive orders shedding more innocent blood, the blood of innocent babies. Then he went on to try and get homosexuals in the military. He put Jocelyn Elders in, trying to distribute condoms to our kids. Christine Gebby, his AIDS czarina, promoting all kinds of vileness. This is an affront to heaven. The second phase of the counterattack was to appoint Robert Fisk as special prosecutor to head up the investigation into Whitewater. That same week, the Rose Law Firm began shredding documents. Lady came to me scared to death, wanted to come out and tell the truth. I said, what's the matter? She said, they're shredding documents at the Rose Law Firm. Well, I tried to tell the media. The media said there was no way that could be going on. Well, in came a journalist from a Washington newspaper. He goes over, investigates what I told him. And you know what? The very week he investigated, guess what they were doing? Shredding documents right there at the Rose Law Firm. It had his initials pretty much all over it, everything from the box to the manila files to I even saw his signature on with the Rose Firm letterhead. You see, all of the Whitewater documents, they're getting rid of. They're getting rid of them as fast as they humanly can. It's the nerve and audacity that those two people, Bill and Hillary Clinton, have to shred documents to destroy evidence in a federal case. That is why we're here in front of the Rose Law Firm, because of the works of darkness that have gone on. Documents have been shredded here. What else has gone on here? I'm telling you, there are people inside this building that right now they're saying, if they only knew, if they only knew. During that same week, there was also a fire at the Worthen Bank building. And this fire was on the 14th floor, and supposedly it was started by a space heater. I want you to look at this footage and tell me if you think it was an accidental fire by a space heater. This is a CPA firm, and the documents that were in this office were important documents relative to Whitewater. If you go back to Arkansas, and you look at the Secretary of State's office, anybody that's ever run for office in recorded history, you can find out who their major campaign contributors are since day one except for one person. Bill Clinton's records at the Secretary of State's office disappeared. You see, they did it then. They'll do it now. All the information pertinent to Whitewater, any notes left by Vince Foster, any personal documents that would lead anywhere to any type of criminal activity, they're just going to be destroyed. 
Fisk's initial assignment was to quell rumors regarding the alleged suicide of Vince Foster. Foster was a senior partner with Hillary Clinton and Webb Hubble at the Rose Law Firm prior to his appointment as White House Deputy Counsel. In fact, he was handling the Clinton's personal legal matters while he was in, in the position of assistant to the president in violation of a conflict of interest at that time. From the outset, the investigation into the death of Vince Foster has been marred by controversy. At Bill Clinton and Attorney General Janet Reno's insistence, responsibility for the investigation was turned over to the Park Police even though Foster's death fell within the jurisdiction of the FBI. Not until his death had sufficiently developed into a full-fledged scandal seven months later would the FBI be allowed in. The results of the FBI's investigation, along with the findings of the Park Police and Coroner, were incorporated into a report issued by Special Counsel Robert Fisk. The report, released June 30, 1994, confirmed suicide as the cause of death. However, a careful examination of key pieces of evidence taken directly from the report itself indicate a number of alarming contradictions inconsistent with the report's own conclusion that Foster took his life. The official coroner's report depicts a large gaping one-inch exit wound located three inches below the crown of Foster's head. According to Fisk, the area surrounding the body at the park was meticulously searched to a depth of 18 inches but no brain tissue or skull fragments were found. An FBI analysis found none of Foster's fingerprints on the gun, despite the fact the gun was found in Foster's hand. However, the FBI did make one extraordinary discovery. One latent fingerprint was visible on the underside of the right pistol grip, approximately two inches from the base of the grip. This print did not belong to Foster. No attempt was made to determine the identity of the person whose print was found on the gun's hand grip. Gunpowder was found on Foster's clothing, which did not match the gun found in his hand. Fisk speculated that gunpowder of a different type was accidentally blown onto Foster's clothing by an exhaust fan in the Park Police Laboratory. However, once again, Fisk was not able to support this theory with any evidence. One of the most crucial pieces of crime scene evidence, the fatal bullet, has yet to be found. A thorough FBI search of the area, which even uncovered artifacts dating back to the Civil War, yielded over 70 pieces of metal, including 12 modern-day bullets. Yet, none of them matched the gun found in Foster's hand. Against standard police procedure, not one resident living nearby was ever contacted during the investigation to find out if a gunshot was heard. Even though Fisk insists that Foster killed himself, Leading forensic experts from around the country now agree it is highly unlikely he pulled the trigger himself. Within minutes of the verification of Foster's identity, the Park Police issued orders to seal Foster's office at the White House. David Watkins, Clinton's administrative assistant, assured the police he would take care of it. He lied. Immediately, high-ranking members of Bill and Hillary's staff began ransacking Foster's office removing important and possibly incriminating documents. The people entering the office included Bernard Nussbaum, counsel to the president, Patsy Thomason, White House administration director, and former assistant to cocaine distributor Dan Lassiter, and Margaret Williams, Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. Patsy Thomason was the top aide for Dan Lassiter when he was running his company and doing all the dope. You can only say that she was there taking care of Dan Laster's interest in the White House. As mentioned earlier, the Arkansas Development Finance Authority had been laundering its drug money through the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. BCCI collapsed in the early 1990s. Millions of depositors and taxpayers lost billions of dollars, making it the worst banking scandal in history. Heading up BCCI was former Defense Secretary Clark Clifford. The overwhelming criminal charges against Clifford were eventually dismissed by President Clinton. The attorney for Clifford and BCCI was none other than Robert Fisk. Fisk knew that a thorough investigation of Whitewater would eventually lead to ADFA and his former client, BCCI. Fisk also knew 
he would never be able to complete his investigation since it is illegal to prosecute a former client. Fisk was not selected by the Justice Department to investigate Whitewater at all, but to simply subpoena documents and testimony, making sure they never see the light of day. The investigation of Whitewater is being handled by an independent special counsel whose appointment I supported. Our cooperation with that counsel has been total. Now think just for a moment. If there are papers that prove you did nothing wrong, then why would you destroy them so that they don't come out? Why would you hide behind subpoenas in the cloak of secrecy? Now, see, Bill and Hillary Clinton have something to hide. And only through a congressional hearing does this nation have a snowball's chance of that truth coming to the light of day. That's the reason it's so imperative that the Congress of the United States rise to the, to the occasion and meet their responsibilities to hold public hearings relative to this matter during this period of time, our justice will never be done. There are lots of people that come to me that want to tell the truth. They come to me, but they're afraid. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of family members or themselves being hurt. Don't be afraid anymore. Bill Clinton doesn't own the world. He doesn't scare me. He shouldn't scare you. I wish all of y'all would do what I've done. Stand up. Stand, stand up for the country. I want my daughter to know that if you stand up and tell the truth, you're okay. Right now, all she sees if you stand up and tell the truth, you'll be destroyed. If you're a pathological liar, lie through your teeth, every breath, hurt people needlessly, you'll get to be president. You don't want that. I, I don't want it. If I had anything to say to Bill Clinton, you know what it'd be? It's bound to be a great burden to walk around lying from one thing to another, to never tell the truth. Bill, tell the truth. Come clean. All of you may not get to be president, but the truth sets you free. It'll set all of us free and it'll save the nation. I've still not been accused of anything wrong because I haven't done anything wrong. And I'm not going to do anything wrong. Although the documented information contained in the Clinton Chronicles continues to be reported in England and other countries, here in America, the media blackout continues. On July 14, 1994, copies of the Clinton Chronicles video were hand-delivered to every member of the United States Senate and House of Representatives. On July 25th, documentation supporting the film was presented to Congress at their request. Whitewater hearings were scheduled to begin the next morning. However, the then House and Senate majority leaders plotting with Robert Fisk to withhold evidence, refused to allow any of this documentation to be admitted. In addition, eyewitnesses willing to testify under oath who could confirm Clinton's involvement in the Arkansas drug smuggling money laundering operation were flown into Washington, but were barred from giving any testimony. Once again, the Constitution of the United States was undermined and the American people were not allowed access to the truth. That same day, a massive media smear campaign was launched against the Clinton Chronicles. Time Magazine, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, and major newspapers around the nation simultaneously published false information about the video in an attempt to diminish its distribution. Nevertheless, members of Congress point to the Clinton Chronicles as playing a major role in bringing about the firing of Robert Fisk, as well as the reopening of the investigation into the death of Vince Foster. On August 3, 1994, Larry Nichols was arrested on false charges of writing two bad checks and failing to obey a yield sign seven years earlier. The American media reported the arrest. When the Arkansas police admitted that the checks and traffic violations were fabricated, charges were dropped. Yet the media failed to report it. Nichols has suffered three attempts on his life since the release of the video. Federal agent Bill Duncan, a 15-year IRS veteran with a permit to carry a gun, was arrested for carrying a weapon then handcuffed to a pipe in the basement of the Washington, D.C. police station and later released. 
This incident effectively brought the MENA drug smuggling money laundering investigation to a halt. Duncan was later instructed by his superiors to lie to a federal grand jury regarding the results of his investigation. When he refused, he was forced to resign. Arkansas State Police Investigator Russell Welsh nearly died after being poisoned with military-grade anthrax, a poison available only through the United States government. Arkansas State Police Investigator Dr. Lauder, who successfully led the investigation against cocaine distributor Dan Lassiter, was forced to resign after attempting to reopen the cocaine trafficking investigation into Don Tyson. John Brown, Saline County homicide detective in charge of the Ives Henry murder investigation, was removed from the case after providing Congress with information linking the Clinton administration to drug trafficking in Mena, Arkansas. Brown was forbidden by his superiors to discuss Clinton's connection to the Ives Henry case, and after his refusal to do so, was forced to resign. In February 1994, veteran journalist L.J. Davis was beaten in his Little Rock hotel room. His attacker tore pages from his notebook which contained information about the inner workings of the Rose Law Firm and the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. In March 1985, Wayne Dumond was castrated and subsequently imprisoned for allegedly raping Bill Clinton's 17-year-old cousin. Even after evidence had proven that Dumond had been falsely accused and was completely innocent, Clinton blocked his release from prison. To date, every case which would link Bill Clinton with any criminal activities have been effectively shut down by various governmental agencies. The one office that all of us universally look up to, irrespective of what party or political philosophy we espouse, is the presidency of the United States. Since the election of Bill Clinton in 1992, we Americans, with sadness, have learned week after week to have different stories come out from around the country pointing up the reality that we have in the White House today a draft dodging womanizer who is a pathological liar. It's a very dangerous thing for America and a dangerous thing for the world. I can only, you know, conclude that the responsible course for the House of Representatives to do is to introduce a resolution of impeachment against Bill Clinton. It is with sadness that I make this statement because this action will introduce something that we Americans don't want to see in our political process. But we can't continue down the course of what we see unfolding before our eyes almost every week or almost every day. And the best thing for all of us is to get it out in the open and go forward and let the chips fall where they may. Under our Constitution, the House introduces a resolution of impeachment, and the U.S. Senate is a place where a trial takes place. And I think for the good of the country, for the good of the peace and tranquility of the Western world, this is the course that Congress should take.